Tommy Coletti. I'm here at the Music Zoo today with Dennis Fano, Fano Guitars. Uh, Gibson? Sure. Fender? Why not? I'll take two. Uh, but these days, there seems to be a, a larger and larger group of what we call boutique guitar builders. And, and there's plenty, and I'm sure if you're, whether you're shopping online or you're talking to your friends or whatever, there's a lot of choices you can make. Uh, we found at the Music Zoo that there's just a few that have really risen to the top and had uh, a bunch of success because they make beautiful guitars, and Dennis being one of them. Uh, and I think you came on my radar probably seven years ago or so, and then we started hearing about your guitars and you and what you did. And uh, I have my idea of what I think you do, but what, where did the, how did you start? Where did the concept come from? Like. You know, me as a guitar player, I grew up with like Eddie Van Halen. So like at one point, I went out, and bought a Warmoth body, and hammered it on the couch, and sure. paint, spray painted my parents' garage somehow. Didn't we all? And yeah. and it sucked, really bad. <laughs> um, Didn't they all? <laughs> and, 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 but so where does it go from like somebody like me or a lot, a ton of people out there doing that and screwing it up, and then getting to the point where you're making like beautiful instruments? Like how, what did I miss that that you figured out? Well, it's a long mean? road. You know, it's not something that just happens overnight, which, you know, sounds kind of cliche, but it takes a lot of time. You know, I started kind of uh, working on my own instruments by, uh, you know, way back in the, in the late 80s. Back in, like, 88, I had this, uh, this 66 jazz bass that, you know, was kind of like the first real instrument I had. I had a few things before that, but nothing to really speak of. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time sort of taking that thing apart, figuring out, you know, finding out what made it work, right. uh, trying to find ways to improve it, converted it from a four string to an eight string at one point, speaking of Warmoth, put a Warmoth, you know, eight string neck on there. Um, so when I look back, it's, it's you know, it, it's been a lot of years, we're talking 25 years now, that I've been, you know, I've had guitars in my hand, and I was playing before that, so started in my teens, around 15, 16, and um, didn't really take this seriously at first. I, I certainly didn't have any, you know, designs on like wanting to become a guitar builder. Um, I really wanted to be a rock star, but that was, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So um, I got a break back in 1995. A friend of mine, uh, Daryl Gilbert, um, asked me if uh, I was still kind of, uh, you know, tinkering with guitars and. What, was I interested in kind of pursuing it yeah, more as like a, you know, you know take it a little, little bit more seriously. And um, the opportunity was to uh, do repair work at uh, Matt Umanoff Guitars down in Greenwich Village. Sure. Great shop, great vintage shop. And um, I spent five years there basically cutting my teeth. That was school for me. I had tried college, didn't really work out for me. I tried it twice actually. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, going going to, to Matt's and uh, putting in five years of working on everything from, you know, ukuleles to auto harps, banjos, acoustics, uh, you know, ele obviously electric guitars and basses. Uh, that was school for me. Um, so that was that 95 to 2000 period somewhere, uh, you know, I might have some of the dates a little bit mixed up, but I think that's about, you know, up the time frame. And, uh, it was after that that I decided I want to kind of go out on my own and, and start, uh, you know, just just try my hand at building my own guitars. Came up with a couple of designs early on, one, two designs, and um, was doing clean guitars uh, long before I started doing distressed guitars. Uh, I was getting too many clients, you know, too many players telling me that guitars were too pretty, too nice. They didn't want to scratch them up. They didn't want to, you know, do anything but leave them hanging on the wall or put it back in the case and I didn't want to hear any of that. They're guitars, they're meant to be played, right. so uh, that's when I really started to kind of delve in the distressed finishes and, and, and making a guitar that really kind of felt uh, inviting, you know, broken in and uh, it, it just that, that feel that, yeah, I want to keep playing this, I don't want to hang it up, I don't, you know, uh, right. don't want to baby it, and, you know. And can I say that, like, most of your guitars, at least from, from my perspective when I look at them, take a perspective of, different famous guitars that are out there. We right. all know Stratocasters and Les Pauls. We're right. all in love with all those guitars and they're wonderful and created, you know, years and years of great music. Yeah. But now you've seen, seen things that maybe say, like, you know, it would be cool if I had a P90 and a 
strat? Or? That's basically it. You know, the, the first model in what started out as the artifact line, and we can kind of get into what the, where the, the name Altifacto came from. Uh, I, originally, I was calling them artifacts. I thought it was a sort of, you know, uh, nice play on the fact that Fender was using the name Relic. Um, the JM6 model was the first thing uh, that I came up with. I wanted to take, uh, you know, kind of that Jazzmaster form and put uh, some of those those things that I liked about Gibsons, especially the P90s, two pneumatic bridge and a stop tail. To me, that was it. I'm, I'm set. That's the perfect guitar. Um, but then, as I, you know, kind of built enough of those, I started to kind of get that itch, and I'm like, well, yeah, I've got some other ideas. Let me, you know, the next thing to come along was the SP6, which uh, I think right now is maybe our our most popular model. So. It was good that I didn't stop at the JM6, and uh, so uh, yeah. I mean, the idea really was to take my favorite, uh, you know, pieces, elements, uh, components of those guitars that I was repairing, you know, those vintage guitars uh, back when I worked at, at Umanos, um, and put them into a single instrument. You know, you can't. The, the things that we're doing are things you can't get from Fender and from Gibson. We're, we're sort of blending those elements and creating kind of this alternate reality. That's where the, the you know the name Altifacto really kind of stemmed from that idea. Like, what if you know all those companies back in the '50s weren't you know kind of dotted uh, all across the landscape, but were actually under one roof? Sure. Um, these might be the sort of instruments that you could find a jazz master style guitar with P90s and a. And, and a I think it makes it palatable too. for guitar players because yeah. guitar players. You know, I think guitar players would all like to think that they're completely free thinkers, and, and they may be, but right. we found, at least here, that they're a pretty conservative group of people that buy the same thing over and over again, sure. and, you know, they'll change the color and think like they've, you know, just like discovered something completely different, yeah. you know? And for builders that we've seen that come in and go, look at my new guitar, and it looks like a spaceship instead of a guitar, it's too far over the end for most guitar players to say, I'm going to make music on that. Yeah. But when they see your stuff, they go, oh, yeah. Well, there's a fine okay. line. There's a fine line between wanting to do something new, but also keep it familiar. And that's what I found with the Altifactos. That was really what was striking a chord with a lot of people. Um, they could look at that guitar without even playing it. They'd have some reference, you know, where they could say, well, I sort of know what that might be. But that's intriguing. I've never seen that before. Now I want to go out right. and then try yeah. that. And that's, so, what we, that's what we're finding here. For right, sure. right. For sure. Yeah, it's been really successful for us. It, it's it's a nice course. little formula. Yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to you know be doing okay. And and uh, did working at at Matt Umanoff's and doing all of the repair and stuff was that all of the training? I mean, you know, like band saws and things like that was you know like were you counting your fingers after you finished like a day's work? Or, you know, like. I've still got all ten, so you know, and none of them are prosthetic. So, uh, uh, yeah, you know, we had um, the majority of our repairs there. Uh, although we did extensive repairs, we didn't have a lot of machinery. We did have, like, you know, a drill press and a band, a small you know, kind of tabletop bandsaw, uh, and a belt sander. Um, my shop isn't all that different today. You know, uh, my home shop. Um, I've got a couple of bandsaws, a couple of belt sanders. You know. Uh, a, a bevy of routers and, and things like that. So I still do a lot of stuff kind of, you know, kind of hands-on. Um, I didn't really have any formal training. My, my formal training was in repairs, not so much in building. Okay. So I'm sort of self-taught. I mean, I did watch videos and tried to gather up as much information sure. as I could as I was learning to do this, uh, but no formal training to, to wow. speak of. that's amazing, that's amazing. Well, the guitars are available here. We're big fans of Fano guitars. Uh, we know that if you play one, you will be too. I want to pre appreciate your time coming down here and hanging with us at the Music Zoo. Fantastic. I love being here. Talk to you soon.